Let me begin by quickly reminding you what is it that we did last time. So most of last week's presentation involved things like these, which are wonderful maps of uh, Asia as seen through the eyes of cartographers who had read or had heard many new travel accounts of intrepid travelers who had uh, gone to uh, the Mongol court. Uh, we also uh, actually did look at some of the texts produced at that time. This is uh, Mandeville, Mandeville's voyages or travels, which is in fact not a uh, real travel text, but rather it's related to travel literature. And I can scroll back and remind you of all the Marco Polo, Odoric of Pordenone, and other similar texts. Basically, we stayed in the 14th century for most of, uh, well, 13th century, late 13th century, uh, and 14th century for most of last week. Uh, as we finished our discussion, we moved into a new period and we began to talk about different conditions for a different vision. Basically, we tried to um, focus a bit on the changed political context that Europe experienced in the 14th century, second half mostly, uh, having to do with um, the um, fall of what is normally known as the Pax Mongolica, or the peace that the Mongols had been able to secure uh, for a large area of uh, Asia, permitting Europeans to actually travel to East Asia. Uh, other things that we reviewed last week had to do with different conditions in Europe proper that had to do with the economy, or that had to do with uh, the rise of a new threat the Turkish threat that made travel to these more difficult, also the plague that killed so many people, and so on and so forth. Against this uh, background, we reviewed very, very quickly the so-called age of discovery. It's a pretty old term, pretty old expression today, but it refers to a large set of uh, so-called discoveries uh, whereby Europeans learned uh, a great deal about the shape of the world. Uh, that's a very, very quick review that we stopped with last week. Basically, what we learned had to do with the fact that from the beginning of the 16th century, the Portuguese out are in the uh, South China Sea areas, engaging in a complicated ballet with the local Chinese authorities. Now, the Portuguese had known why the Portuguese exactly, why do you hear me mention the Portuguese rather than Europeans at large, because they spearheaded this um, discover, age of discovery uh, um, era. Uh, they financed many, many um, expeditions and they were the ones that for a long while uh, had a monopoly of the Asian travel. Now they had known about the Chinese for quite a while, the very, one of the very last things we did last week, actually read the instructions that one such explorer had received with regard to what he was supposed to inquire about in relation to the Chinese. Uh, and then we discussed these four people. Basically, we first mentioned Tom Pirsch, the man who headed uh, the first modern European embassy to the Ming uh, dynasty court. It failed for a number of reasons. It's a complicated, interesting, fascinating story. A great deal of the failure had to do with the behavior of fellow Portuguese people in the South China Sea. This gentleman here also has a great deal to do with this particular failure. His behavior was certainly not uh, appropriate for uh, a state for a power wanting to open trade or open relations with another power. Now, we know a great deal of information about these events uh, from a variety of sources. Some of the most fascinating sources are a 
couple, a number of letters produced by two men who were associated with the embassy and came to be uh, imprisoned in southern China. And from there, they were able to write these letters, probably, and send them to Europe, probably in 1524. Some people used to say maybe in 1534. Let's accept this date uh, provisionally as correct. According to people who take this date uh, as correct, then it's 1527 that the letters actually made it to Europe. They were never published at that time. We have an edition of these letters coming up much later. Uh, if my memory serves me right, it's only in the early 20th century that we have a modern edition of these texts. However, they were well known. Uh, they circulated, they were used by historians and by other people when putting together information about China. After all, this is the very first account we know about, or we uh, or extended account we know about, that describes firsthand what it was for a European to be in China in the 1520s or the 1530s. Mind you, not in a particularly good position. They were prisoners. They had been accused together with other members of the embassy of having done or of having engaged in all sorts of inappropriate forms of behavior and they didn't have it easy. Now, we do not really have time to read fully the, two, the letters of the two prisoners. Uh, they are fascinating, well, from a large variety of perspectives. One reason why I think that they are worth your time, should you decide to uh, explore them in some detail, is the fact that they are obviously written with an agenda. The men who write them are in jail and they want out. And they want, because they want out, they have an interest in portraying China in a certain way and also in urging the uh, recipients of the letters into action, particularly into attacking China and freeing them, among other things. I will leave aside the whole context that the most exciting of these letters that by Cristovan Vieira begins with. In it, the story of the embassy is told. The reasons of its failure are given from the perspective of the Portuguese and I will concentrate mostly on the actual information that the second part of Vieira's letter in particular gives about China. From this part we learn about the uh, administrative divisions of China. So China is said to be divided into 15 provinces. Uh, a quite uh, well uh, argued, quite well um, um, uh, structured account of the administrative um, setup of China at the time is also given. Uh, it doesn't make into a fascinating read, but it's good information. Yeah, so and, and it's solid. <coughs> it stayed important in later texts for a long while. Then we learn about what China produces and what is uh, of interest from the perspective of, of a European. Of course, the two prisoners are interested in war-related matters. So we have information on ships and on the army and on the fortifications. We also have information on geography, on cities, and so on and so forth. One particular area receives a wide, large-scale description. It has to do with the city of Guangzhou, where, in fact, the two are held prisoner in Canton. Now, there is a lot of uh, uh, data here that is new and uh, or is new for, for uh, of course, from the perspective we adopt here, which is uh, uh, that of a European at that time. Uh, some of it uh, echoes nicely earlier tropes about, for example, the skilled uh, artistry of local people. Um, there is new information on justice, that 
is of much concern for the prisoners. So we learn about the uh, way that justice was being administered in Ming times, particularly about how magistrates were nominated from the center and then how they were uh, allowed to stay for a limited number of years in a local place and then move to a different uh, position, to a different place and so on and so forth. This is the point where Vieira in particular, the one from whose late letter I quote, or, I ref or the one to whose late letter I refer mostly, has to do with, uh, uh, brings up the topic of the local people's dissatisfaction with their authorities. Basically, he says, uh, people are unhappy with their mandarins, with their uh, leaders, uh, because they are not treated correctly, uh, justice is not fair, and uh, given this situation, locals would support a potential war of Portugal against China should the case come, or should that happen. Now, if this sounds to you a bit crazy, uh, do realize that uh, this is only the first in a number of, uh, in among quite a few accounts written from the perspective of a person who is not having a good time in China, who is a prisoner or who has suffered one way or another, or uh, who uh, has in later times uh, a completely inaccurate vision about uh, the military power of China. So we do have quite a few accounts suggesting or just basically writing plainly that a European power or another, mostly Spain at the end of, towards the end of the century, should organize uh, its uh, uh, troops and basically invade China. Uh, there are many other things from these letters which would be worth our time. Uh, Vieira, for instance, talks about um, he was able to uh, study Chinese, so he was a speaker of the language, and he also uh, refers to books he had read. So some of the information on the geography of China comes from books rather than from what he hears. So he's an educated person who comes, who brings uh, actual early uh, 15th century Chinese information to an European audience. Um, his way of writing is also fascinating through its mixture of what is obviously an attempt to reflect his own experience, so it reads like a kind of biographical account, and his obvious agenda. So from a literary perspective, at least Vie Vasco Calvo's uh, letter is uh, quite an interesting read. Uh, the text is available in Portuguese, it's available in English and in French in modern editions, so the texts so feel free to explore them if you have more time than I do, because I need to move on with these. Anyways, the two texts were important, and they were important because, uh, among other things, they were used by this man. This, Juan de Baruch, is one of the many very, very important Portuguese chroniclers of the expansion of the Portuguese Empire and it's the way it got built um, throughout uh, the late uh, 15th, early 16th century together with, with Castaneda and several others he wrote um, texts that are essential in Portuguese literature and very very interesting for us as well. Mostly um, uh, Barushis. Why? Because literarily it reads, as far as I can judge, very, very nicely. Um, and also because he relies on a really huge amount of data that he collected and gathered um, from people, he actually interrogated people, travelers, explorers, Chinese people. He was said to have a servant or a slave 
who was Chinese, he actually he mentions this himself. Uh, the information that we can, uh, that he circulated uh, in his text was um, very, very new and remained uh, in, at mid-century um, extremely important for the European, the general European knowledge of China. Now, um, most of the information I'm giving you here comes from a book by a man known as, let me see where this is, known as Donald Luck. Now, Luck was a historian of East-West relations and he produced a series of books, actually it's one single book with many, many volumes, known as Asia in the Making of Europe. This has several volumes and sev each volume is divided into several books. The last uh, one in the series was uh, co-written co with another historian. This is an essential text for anybody who is interested in East-West relations. It's a wonderful read. It's, uh, the man's scholarship was immense. He knew everything at a time when the internet did not exist. He actually did things that sound particularly old-fashioned, like he actually went to libraries and touched books and leafed through. He could read many, many languages, and this is one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. Uh, warmly recommended, most of the information that I get here is uh, based on Luck's uh, first volume. Now, uh, according to Luck, Castaneda uh, mentions the um, Chinese abilities, uh, various skills, the trope of the skillful Chinese, as you very well know, has been around for quite a while. Um, he mentions uh, information about education, Chinese education, one of the earliest Europeans to do so. Uh, he mentions the uh, peacefulness of the Chinese, as you very well know, this is a long-term tradition. He uses the formula of son of heaven in relation to the emperor. He no notices eunuchs, he notices all sorts of officials and the bureaucracy. Basically, he is the first to also make a list of some of the official names for the first time in European sources. Baruch, on the other hand, who has access, as I told you, to m much more information, is um, um, a much more interesting read and uh, a, a much more fascinating read. He tells us about the Great Wall. He tells us about... Um, um, uh, he gives us accurate information about uh, the organization of the Chinese state. Uh, he divides the 15 provinces into maritime and interior areas. Counts the number of cities, of large cities, to two, 2,244. Uh, um, he actually uh, uh, makes a quite accurate uh, description of the way in which uh, towns are divided into metropolises and uh, cities and smaller towns. He uh, also notices things about uh, the way that the Chinese treat foreigners, uh, making a comparison with the Greeks in this respect. He brings up the trope of the uh, two-eyed Chinese. You remember we discussed about it last week. The Chinese are the only ones having two eyes. Europeans have only one while the rest of the world is blind. You already know about this from Hayton's uh, Flor des Estuaires. Uh, he um, mentions the fact that the Chinese have the art of printing, something that uh, was not commonly repeated at the time. He insists on the differences between South and North China. He mentions the use of artillery. He mentions something that would stay in European imagination for a long time. He basically talks about land ships, ships that are able to, uh, well, sail on land. You will see exactly what I mean in a short while. Um, he um, obviously, uh, he dedicates uh, quite a few pages to the city of Canton, to the city of uh, Guangzhou, based on uh, the, two, the letters of the two uh, 
prisoners. He also mentions uh, aspects of the daily lives, daily life of the Chinese, their uh, appetite for uh, fun and entertainment, for food, for festivals. He also notices the fact that um, beggars are not to be found, something that was particularly impressive from the perspective of a European at that time and so on and so forth. I will show you the image of the landship of uh, um, Barushi's uh, landship in a short while. Now, um, the next person we need to talk about is another prisoner. His name was Galiote Pereira. Uh, he was able to escape from a prison in uh, China to Macau, there to put down his experiences in writing. This account made it to Europe, where it was translated into Italian and then into English. It was quite, uh, it had quite some impact and I'm quoting from another book which I warmly recommend to everybody who has an interest in the period by a British histor historian by the name of Charles Boxer. The name of this book is South China in the 16th century. Uh, it, it contains three different translations of three different travelers of the uh, time, China in the 16th century. And uh, the very first in this text is Galiote Pereira's account, which is reproduced in the uh, Elizabethan translation of Richard Willis. That's why it's going to sound a bit funny when you read it in English. Now, uh, there are many interesting aspects in Pereira's account that have to do both with the information he gives and with the way this information is phrased. Uh, there is a certain pleasure of writing that uh, separates and a certain insouciance with regard to the way things are described. An attitude that radically separates stylistically this adventurer's work from the accounts of the historians discussed earlier that make Pereira's account such an attractive read. Now I will move through this a bit more quickly. Notice that he, unlike uh, contemporary texts, acknowledges the fact that uh, Europeans do not really know much about uh, China. He acknowledges European ignorance, plainly. Uh, he lists the usual, he gives the usual uh, administrative and geographic information. He is aware that uh, probably, at least in writing for the first time, in the case of a European, about how large China is in fact. The fact that uh, all European kingdoms would appear very, very small. Notice that he says this kingdom is so large that under five months you are not able to travel from the towns by the sea to the court and back again. This is uh, a quite significant uh, statement. As usual, as you can notice, we do have the Chinese version there. I will always refer to the English one, as you know, but for your reference, the Chinese version is there as well. Uh, immensity of land does not equal greatness. There are things that, and we learned this quite early, don't function perfectly all the time. Um, there are people, for example, who are very poor. He mentions this. Uh, all in all, as we keep on reading, we have a feeling that uh, 
he's trying to be as objective as he can, producing what reads like a quite balanced, well-written, well-articulated account. Um, notice, for instance, here, comparatism, something that, or a comparative touch that is obvious on almost every single page in the text. He compares the Chinese cities with other cities of the world. And he basically puts it, he, does, he makes the comparison directly. These cities are as well walled as any cities in all the world. So what we find there is interesting, is exciting, but we can compare it to other things we are familiar with and learn something from this comparison. Notice, however, that he then adds that he has never seen such mighty bridges like those in China and that there are no better builders than the Chinese. He notices all sorts of things about the uh, various Chinese practices. He notices how the uh, Chinese collect excrements and use them as fertilizer and comments positively on this, something that later Europeans won't be so happy about. He also notices, just like many, many travelers, how much the Chinese love to eat. They are the greatest eaters in the world, and how much they like pork, how they also like frogs and hens and dogs and cats and rats and snakes and all sorts of other things. Uh, he describes the cities as being very, very beautiful and being very great and having magnificent uh, um, gates and walls. He says that uh, there is no artillery unlike Barush. And then he moves on to discuss about other things that Europeans talked about a uh, great deal of. Uh, he talks about the imperial exams and the way the imperial exams select uh, people. The bureaucracy of China is selected by um, 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 examination. Uh, adding yet another comment on how much the Chinese like to eat and drink. Uh, the account is pretty interesting and quite, quite detailed. And then he makes uh, uh, a quite famous uh, comment on the way the Chinese people eat after so much talk about eating. So the uh, Chinese sit on stools at high tables uh, as we do. They are very cleanly, although they use neither tablecloths nor napkins. Whatsoever is set down upon the board is first carved before it be brought in. They feed with to sticks, refraining from touching their meat with their hands, even as we do with forks. Nor is the nation only civil at meat, that is while eating, but also in conversation. And in courtesy they seem to exceed all other. Likewise in their dealings after their manner they are so ready that they far pass all other Gentiles and Moors, that is all other non Christians, non-Europeans. Um, the greater states are so vain that they line their clothes with the best silk that they may, that may be found. So this has to do with daily practices of rich uh, uh, upper classes. Notice the comment on the chopsticks. Notice the comment on the refined atmosphere of a meal. Notice the comment on the quality of clothing. So this is uh, a quite famous paragraph on uh, the uh, refinement of the Chinese, a trope that would appear over and over again. Now, religion and morals. The Chinese are not Christian. They are idolaters. However, if at any times this country might be joined in league with the Kingdom of Portugal in such wise that free access uh, were had to deal with the people there, they might all be soon converted. This optimism about uh, 
the potential success of Christianity once it reaches China is constant in 16th century texts. Many a writer is convinced that the Chinese are reasonable, advanced, well-educated, rational people who once exposed to the truths of Christian religion will immediately turn Christian. This, again, is an exceedingly common trope. Just as common, well, not quite just as common, but pretty common, is the idea that homosexual practices, a vice very common in the meaner sort, are very usual in China. This perspective appears in many travel texts. Mind you, not only in connection with the Chinese. We can find this about many of the peoples Europeans interact with. Always take such information with a large grain of salt. Among other things, it is present there in such texts because of a need that Europeans felt to emphasize difference and make a point or more points about Christian morality. This is very, very common, a very, very common point made in many texts, mind you, not only about the Chinese. So once you read um, uh, the lit literature of travel of the time, we find this information about many of the peoples the uh, Europeans interact with. Uh, always take it with a grain of salt. It's a part of among other things, uh, it's, uh, it's present there as a way of emphasizing difference and emphasizing uh, the need for a Christian-based morality. Now, justice is um, considered to be exceptional in China. This is written by a prisoner who was able to uh, uh, face the system and actually not only survive it but escape relatively okay. His own judgment is blunt and quite direct. He basically says that these Gentiles, these, these non-Christians, exceed many Christians in terms of justice and truth. So his co the comparative dimension here acquires a sense of superiority of China to Europe in terms of justice. Just as we have seen before in the case of bridges and buildings, he in fact gives uh, information about, uh, quite detailed information about uh, <coughs> the process of uh, uh, obtaining information, the treatment of prisoners. He talks about the cruelty of punishments inflicted on accused people who are tortured in order for the judges to obtain confessions. He talks about the uh, um, attempts of uh, the uh, officials to stay just even while uh, um, torturing or uh, attempting to confess uh, through violence, uh, to obtain confessions through violence. And um, in this particular passage, uh, Pereira gives a first hand account of why he says all these things and why he is convinced that the Chinese are superior to the Europeans in their dealings. Uh, in their justice-related uh, aspects. We poor strangers brought before them might say what we would, as all to be lies and fallacies that they did right. Nor did we stand before them with the usual ceremonies of that country. Yet did they bear with us so patiently that they caused us to wonder, knowing specially how little any advocate or judge is wont in our country to bear with us. For wheresoever in any town of Christendom should be accused unknown men as we were, 
I know not what end the very innocent cause would have, would have. But we, in a heathen country, have in our great enemies two of the chiefest men in a whole town, wanting an interpreter, ignorant of that country language, did in the end see our great adversaries cast into prison for our sake and deprived of their offices and honor for not doing justice, yea, not to escape death. For, as the rumor goes, they shall be beheaded. So basically, persons who, a European who in such a, in a similar context would have stood no chance in Europe, in China, was able to benefit from mercy, from an understanding, from uh, uh, a chance to explain from uh, his own perspective the situation uh, that uh, brought him in front of the law. This is uh, very interesting and this sense of uh, China and justice uh, will be uh, discussed many many times throughout the texts of the century. Once again it makes sense because more often than not Europeans who made it to China or who got in touch with the Chinese one way or another ended up by being brought in front of the law either because of their trade practices or because they were illegally there or for a number of reasons. So we do have quite a few accounts, many of which emphasize the perceived cruelty of torture, but some of which also emphasize the justice, the characteristics of Chinese justice. Uh, the same idea that there are no beggars in, um, uh, in uh, China, all in all, a vivid, articulate, exciting text to read, pleasant, uh, important in the sense that it was, as you have noticed, or as you know already, it, ha it was translated and uh, it was read quite significantly. He didn't mention, just like Marco Polo, quite a few things. He didn't mention tea drinking, he didn't mention food binding, he didn't mention printing, he didn't mention writing. So again, does this mean in any sense that he didn't go there, as some people would believe about Marco Polo, that would be crazy. So once again we cannot judge the truthfulness of an account through what it does not mention. This is followed by what is the very first European book specifically dedicated to China. The book appeared in 1569. It is the work of a Dominican friar who went to China and stayed there for about one month or five weeks in 1556 from first-hand information and from um, um, careful perusal of texts such as Pereira's and others, Da Cruz put together a very interesting and exciting read. The text did not seem to have circulated much but it is an important book, influencing several later texts. It was translated quite late into English, partially in the 1620s and fully only much, much later. But the text is exciting because it does tell us what um, Europeans what an educated European could know about China in, around this period. Now, the book begins with a preface, and in the preface we know that da Cruz's motivation is or was primarily religious. He talks about how he uh, is writing this book in order to uh, be able to uh, spread Catholic faith, Christianity, among uh, idolaters.
he is interested in emphasizing uh, the qualities of his text in comparison to uh, um, what could be produced by a person who never traveled there. So he emphasizes his direct uh, testimony, the fact that he uh, had, had access to uh, uh, information about China from the source and that uh, seeing is rather than hearing about things Chinese is what makes his account really really valuable. The sight thereof makes a very different impression from what is heard or read about it. He did take some pride therefore in his um, um, trip to China. The Chinese would be willing to embrace Christianity. The reason is that they love reason. They are rational people who would uh, accept Christianity on a rational basis. As we move on, he states that um, his own account is based not only on what he has found in China, but also on the books he has read. And these he dismisses to a large degree. He has no qualms about rejecting stories that Europeans had uh, repeated for many, many centuries about Asia as a land of monsters, of griffins, of Arimaspi or whatever. He, in fact, calls such accounts fables. In some cases, <coughs> he tries to find out some um, um, potential reason why uh, oh, uh, ancient European historians made a point or another and the reasons he gives are based in the realities he sees in uh, China. He imagines also contact between uh, the ancient world and China with the Romans influencing directly the Chinese on one practice or another. Basically he says that the laws and the general um, um, political development of China could have been obtained from the Romans. Also the ways of eating and other similar things which he notices only the Chinese have uh, among the peoples of Asia. Uh, this is uh, the scholar writing rather than the observer. Much more interesting uh, for him is, uh, and for us, is the fact that he dedicates uh, a long um, passage to Chinese writing. This appears for the first time in a text of the period we are focusing on in a really extended manner. The uh, text uh, on uh, uh, or the paragraphs that Da Cruz writes um, cover one and a half pages and they uh, put together a series of ideas that had already been formulated but which with Da Cruz acquire a formulation that would become exemplary. Primarily, according to Da Cruz, Chinese characters represent a kind of language independent of speech, a kind of visual language that can be read by everybody from South China to North China and also in Japan 
and all around. So you don't need to know the language, it's enough to know the written language or the speech, the uh, characters, for you to be able to communicate. This belongs to um, what a famous linguist by the name of John de Francis called the European myths of the Chinese language. Uh, he wrote several interesting books. The one I have in mind here is known as um, Chinese language, the Chinese language fact and fantasy. In particular, he calls this idea that uh, somehow Chinese characters represent a visual language independent of speech and able to communicate ideas directly to the minds of people, the universality myth. He mentions a total of six myths that Europeans uh, developed historically about the Chinese language. Read this book if you have an interest in this. It's a fascinating and wonderful read. Uh, <clears throat> I will move uh, into the text after the break. Before we do that, let me show you this page which comes from a letter that was published in 1570. The letter dates from 1555. It was written by a, um, a missionary in Japan. The missionary's name was Balthazar Gagu. And here we see for the first time in a printed European text, well, kanji and hiragana. Gagu also adds a translation and makes a number of very interesting comments related to what he takes to be the ambiguity of the characters that he has studied and talks about. We don't have time to go into this, but uh, the reason I use this image here while illustrating Da Cruz is to let you know that at about the same time, 1569, 1570, a visual presence in print of Chinese characters is available in uh, this selection of Jesuit letters coming from Japan which were very very popular. They were widely read and uh, widely circulated. So words such as da cruzis actually acquired substance. People could actually see Chinese characters in print in Europe. I don't mean here people like kings or very very rich uh, or uh, aristocrats or whatever who already had access to Chinese books. So we know about Chinese books making it to Europe uh, probably from, uh, let me see, uh, early 15th century, I think. So we already know about Chinese books being available uh, or reaching uh, a king or a pope. I'm not talking about this, I'm talking about European books printing Chinese characters. Please have your break and then we will continue. Let us begin by reviewing the first passage related to Chinese writing that I have selected from Da Cruz's book. They have the same writing that the Chinas have, although their speech be different. And while they can understand each other in writing, they cannot understand each other's speech. And do not let anyone think that I am deceiving him because in China there are many differences of language for the which reason many of them do not understand each other's speech yet they understand each other's writing. This continues. The Chinas have no fixed letters in their writing for all they write is by characters and they compose words of these, whereby they have a great multitude of characters, signifying each thing by a character. So characters, notice, signify things rather than represent words. In such sort that only one character signifies heaven, another earth and another man, and so forth with everything else. But with all you must know that they also use 
certain characters to write names which are or seem to be outlandish. This is the reason why in all China there are many tongues in so that one man cannot understand another by speech, nor do the Kauchin Chinas, this is uh, Southeast Asia, understand the Chinas, nor the Japoins, the Chinas, when they speak, yet they all understand each other in writing. For example, the character which signifies heaven to them all, being written in the same way by them all, some pronounce it in one way and others in another, but it signifies heaven equally to them all. This takes us to the uh, more extended version of the universality myth, as well as a version, a mild version, about uh, what is known, according to John De Francis, as the ideography myth, the idea that somehow characters represent ideas or things directly, rather than words. Um, now, he is, uh, Da Cruz is, uh, builds a great deal on his first um, hand experience. Um, he talks about houses, he talks about uh, the materials houses are built on, are built from. Uh, he also notices the uh, number of poor people, much smaller than in the, uh, uh, the West. Uh, he notices um, all sorts of things that nobody before him had noticed. Uh, for example, he notices the fact that the Chinese like to keep birds in cages and take much pleasure in hearing them sing. He also comments on print, something we have of course seen before, but he also adds information about long, how long print had been in use in China. Da Cruz is uh, less exciting a read than Pereira, but of interest, because he can be subtle in his observations and uh, he does notice the world uh, 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 around him with quite an open-minded, in quite an open-minded way. Incidentally, these are illustrations showing uh, Portuguese people traveling to Japan for trade and religious related reasons at that time. It's a whole category of art known as Southern Barbarian kind of art, the Nambam art. And we, such objects are very, very beautiful and tell us how the people who actually did these travels look like or were seen, were perceived by the people they visited, how they behaved and how they interacted. We don't have time to uh, look at them in some detail, but I like them quite a lot. Uh, the city of Canton, its richness and something that would be often repeated in later times. China needs uh, nothing comes, in, in the case of China, nothing comes from without China, neither goes out of it. To put it otherwise, the Chinese do not need to export anything and certainly do not need to import anything else. In later times, this idea that China is self-sufficient and it engages in trade only in order to help the poor foreigners who otherwise would die without Chinese products would appear in the official discourse of the Tianlong Emperor when uh, interacting with the very first British embassy uh, in 1793, the Makani Embassy. This trope, this idea that we Chinese don't really need the outside world, but okay, we are nice and benevolent and basically decide, okay, let's help these poor foreigners get what they need because otherwise they would die. This idea comes here and there quite often, both now and in later times as well. Notice that this time it is, however, articulated by a European. He uh, notices also, and here I'm quoting from uh, Jonathan Spence's uh, The Chance Great Continent, just like a bit earlier, he does notice the uh, violence of, uh, and the cruelty of the uh, legal system torturing people in order to obtain confessions. His comments 
echo very much Pereira's. All in all, there are many similarities with Pereira here, just like when he mentions the existence of homosexuality or different other matters. Still, Da Cruz does speak, as I said before, with a different voice in what remains a highly interesting text. The very last person we'll mention in this PPT is, well, somebody quite different from everybody we have talked about today. He is a writer who did um, travel to Asia and produced and uh, uh, had a text published under his name after uh, he had died. The name of this text is Peregrinations or Travels. There, are, there is a lot of information in this text that sounds realistic, but many people believe that much exaggeration or fictional aspects are also very much present. It's a fascinating read, and that's why the question, just like Mandeville, that's why the question here, is this the new Mandeville? That is another writer who produces a text from his mind and claims it to be real, to reflect reality? Be that as it may, it's a wonderful text. It's a novel, or it reads like a novel rather, a romance, uh, more, more specifically. Uh, it has uh, a very strong uh, octorial, very powerful authorial, octorial voice. Uh, so the writer is very present behind his lines and very beautifully so. Uh, there are many ups and downs in the adventures of the traveler, first person travel. And there is a lot of humor and a huge amount of satire that seems to be directly uh, uh, oriented against contemporary Spanish and Portuguese uh, society. Uh, one passage in particular is worth our time. Before we do it, let me quote from Spence again, uh, who himself quotes a modern uh, translator into English of the text. Uh, 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 according to this scholar's analysis, stylistically the book is written uh, from different or with different voices, the most dominant of which is the one of satire, as uh, uh, I mentioned a bit earlier. If indeed Rebecca Katz is right when she makes this analysis, then perhaps we should be reading the peregrinations just like Spence suggested we should read Marco Polo's account as well, as a mirror of contemporary European society. This passage in particular is a masterpiece of uh, uh, good writing. So, it all began, I'm going to read all this because it's, it's, it's just too fun. It all began when two of the nine men in our group got into an argument about which one of the noble families had better accommodations at the court of the king our lord, the, Madu, the Madureiras of the, or the Fonsecas. One word led to another and before we knew it they were resorting to the vulgar language of fishwives and asking each other, who do you think you are? And well, who do you think you are? When both of them had little more than nothing to their names. By this time, they had worked themselves up into such a rage that one of them gave the other a hard slap in the face and in reply received a wide slash with a knife across the face, which left him with half of his cheek hanging down. Now close your eyes and try to portray, to visualize how crazy the whole thing is building up out of nothing. The wounded man then grabbed the poleaxe and chopped off the other's arm. After that, a fight really began. So, everything so far was not a fight. This is the moment when a real fight begins. And all, when all nine of us became embroiled in this unfortunate argument, 
The situation goes so out of control that seven of us were badly wounded by the time the Chime himself came running up with all the unchachis of the law. Names related to various uh, officials, minor officials there. After taking us in hand, they immediately gave us, gave each of us, 30 strokes of the lash, probably to calm them down which left us bloodier than we had been from our wounds. And they threw us into an underground dungeon where they kept us for 46 days, adding to our misery by keeping us with fetters on our feet, manacles on our hands and collars round our necks. So finally, justice, we see foreigners here who actually do nothing against the Chinese, but they're just stupid enough in their behavior that they get, you know, to, to prison. Our case was then placed in the hands of the prosecutor who drew up an indictment against us. One of the charges he made against us, supported by evidence obtained from 16 eyewitnesses, was that we were a people who had neither fear nor any knowledge of God, who only paid lip service to him as any beast could do if it had the gift of language. For if men of the same nationality, the same flesh and blood, the same king and country, the same language and religion could wound and kill each other so mercilessly for no cause or reason, then the only possible explanation for it was that we were slaves in the service of the ravenous serpent of the, mouse of, of, of the house of smoke. That is a non-god or a kind of imaginary idol, a fact which we had amply demonstrated for the serpent always acted that way. To put it otherwise that we are servants of the devil. Now notice that the Chinese judge is basically said to accuse the Christians of being non-Christian and behaving in a non-Christian manner, of being stupid, of being violent for no good reason, and of being ultimately vain, which is, as we can obviously notice from the beginning of the passage. Now, it seems to me quite clear that the story narrated here by Pintu has a very strong fictional character. Its satirical features stand out, and the comic crescendo that articulates it testifies quite well, I would say, to its literariness. The characters that get ridiculed here for their vanity and their willingness to engage in extended conflict for the sake of their honor seem to come directly from the pages of a novel. Of course, the whole Chinese setting also looks very much like a simple backdrop against which Pinto's characters better show their vacuity, their violent inclinations and the like. Similar passages are not difficult to find in the text, and they are much fun to read. In this one, for instance, we have in fact a connection to the two letters with which we started today's discussion. Take a look here and notice that the ambassador Tomu Pirish is mentioned, just like Vashku Kalv. We don't really know what happened to this man. We presume he died in prison after he wrote his letter together with Cristovan Vieira. Here, in this narrative, he is said to have settled down in China, to have started a family, and to be meeting uh, the narrator here, the first person narrator, to invite him to his house and introduce him to his wife and children. And that's how Vasco Kavu becomes a character in a novel. And for a while, people in Europe, I mean for a longer while, people were wondering, could this be true? Could in fact the, the two prisoners with whom we started today's discussion, could they have survived? Indeed, as the novel, as this text seems to imply. Well, this and many other things are beautifully present here uh, one last thing as we uh, finish uh, the discussion on Pintu because we don't have much time. I must confess that I'm already beginning to worry about how I will be able to describe even the little that I did, that we did see 
of it, of China or of, of the city of Peking. Not that it would seem strange to anyone who has already seen the other wonders of the kingdom of China. But because I fear that those people who try to measure the many things that are to be found in the countries they have never seen against the little they see in their native lands will doubt or perhaps refuse completely to believe those things that do not confirm, conform to their ideas and limited experience. It's a very smart man writing these lines, right? So basically he says, I'm a traveler confronted with a reality I'm not well equipped to describe. So you won't believe my words because you have no way of fully understanding them. Is this a narrator fooling around with us as readers? Is it a traveler who is truly aware of of the difficulty of describing what he sees? If so, he's a very self-conscious traveler because we have never seen anything like this so far. Literarily speaking, it's wonderful. Okay? Anyway, leaving aside the question of how fictional such passages are, I need to state again that the image of China or China that the text builds is very, very interesting. It is available in an English translation, as you already know. I haven't been able to find a Chinese one. It may have been translated. I don't know. But if you do have time and curiosity to go through it, please do. It's a wonderful read for uh, 17th century literature. I'll skip the rest. Uh, the very last uh, uh, passage here is also worth your time, but we need to move on to what was supposed to be today's presentation, which is dedicated to late 16th century chroniclers of China towards the Jesuit century. Now, late 16th means from the 1570s on, and we have a number of important texts, and uh, I will go through them as quickly as I can. The very first one I need to uh, mention here is the work of a man who never set foot in China. His name is Bernardino de Escalante. He was a Spanish priest and sailor who in 1577 had a book known as Discurso de la Navegación published in Seville, if my memory is right. And this text was translated in 1579 under the title A Discourse of the Navigation and became quite well known. Escalante, as I told you, never traveled to China, but he was a good reader of Chinese-related stuff. He had read Da Cruz. Da Cruz's text did not circulate much. Baruch, the Portuguese chronicler I mentioned a bit earlier, and several other sources. Uh, Escalante's uh, the impact of Escalante's text again was significant with the English translation also contributing to it. Now let's take a look here at the original Spanish version. These are the subheads that appear on top of the page and they read very very simply navigation to India and the greatness of China. In the English translation all this becomes the conquest of the East Indies. So as the text moved from Spanish into English it also acquired a different agenda. In its original Spanish it was meant to provide information. In the uh, English translation it was meant to encourage exploration and the discovery of the world with an English flavor. This will become more apparent as we uh, move on and discuss about travel anthologies and Richard Hacklett 
and his friends and uh, his uh, environment. Right now, from Escalante's book, which is large, a uh, hundred pages, it's described as short here, but in fact, uh, for a text specifically dedicated to China, it's not. The interesting part has to do, well, there, it's got many interesting parts. One of the most interesting ones has to do with, again, Chinese language and Chinese characters. One thing that separates um, this text from everything else is the approximation of the number of Chinese characters that is given. According to Escalante, in China there are about 5,000 characters. He also mentions how he uh, uh, discussed with Chinese people over their way of writing and he makes the usual statements according to which Chinese writing is a kind of universal medium functioning independently from speech and also formulates what John de Francis, I mentioned this name earlier, called the ideographic myth. Notice the beautiful formulation in the last paragraph. Escalante says that people in China and around it talk one with another in writing. Also, the very beginning of his passages on writing is of much interest. Notice, please. The people of China have no number of letters in their ABC, for all that they write is by figures signifying the heaven, which they call Guant, by one only figure, which is this. There, we should expect to see a Chinese character. Hold on, we don't see it here. And the king, which they call Bontai, which is this. And then we expect the Chinese character as well. Later on, he talks about a city, which is this. Now, in the English version, which I quote here, uh, sorry, in the original, indeed, you would have the Chinese characters. These make up the famous three Chinese characters of Bernardino de Escalante. They look, this is the first, this is the second, and this is the third. Now you will agree with me that the only one that makes a bit of sense for our eyes is this. We do recognize this one, right? Now this is supposed to be this. And we kind of notice it. We kind of get it. As to what this is, we have no clue. Some people say it's this, some people say it's this, and trust me, there have been several other versions. Whatever it is, we don't know. In the English translation, the letters, the letters, the Chinese letters, once again, appear like this for the first two, in a kind of, an, of a blank space in the English text. So we don't have the word and the Chinese character. We have like the text in Latin characters and then somewhere in the middle a kind of a blank space filled with this. So it becomes completely unclear. Cheng would be this, which if you notice it's more or less the same thing turned upside down or manipulated a bit. Now these were, these, fame, these three characters became so famous and they kept on being reproduced all the way until the 18th century in, an, in a version of Escalante's text published in um, 1745 I think we have yet another manipulation as they circulated they also came to be completely distorted and this is how they look in a 1613 text in French text this would be heaven this would be king and this would be 
uh, well, no, it's the other way around, I think. You, this would be heaven, this would be king, and this would be city. Yeah, because here the writer made a mistake, uh, reversed the order of the two. So this is what Europeans took Chinese characters to look like in popular texts such as Escalantes and later for quite a number of years. Do notice, on the other hand, we know from the previous PPT that as, late, as early as 1570 we already have kanji and hiragana published and circulating. Now, it's no, there's no time for me to talk about Escalante. Uh, that's why I focused only on um, um, writing. And the reason I cannot focus on Escalante is that I need to give more time to Mendoza. This Spanish Augustinian monk was ordered by the Pope to put together a history of things known about China. He read everything, he stole everything he could from other books and put together in 1585 a history of the most important, most notable things related to China. This was translated very, very quickly into many European languages and became the very first China bestseller published in Europe. For about, I would say, 70 years or so, it remained one of the most quoted texts about China. It was replaced in terms of impact only by the Matteo Ricci Nicola Trigo um, compilation of uh, or uh, text of 1615 we'll talk about next week. Um, the influence of this text was enormous. My references to it will be to the English version of 1588 <coughs> under the title The History of the Great and Mighty Kingdom of China. Now, notice that we have more than 46 editions in the 16th century only. And it continued to be published in the 17th century as well. One reason why the text was so popular has to do with its ability to synthesize information that was well known and add to it information that circulated but much less widely. For example, uh, a very important account, we'll talk about it next week probably, by um, another Augustinian uh, 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 friar who actually traveled to China, his name was Martin de Rada, uh, was never published but was widely used by Mendoza in order to put together his text. Another reason why um, Mendoza's text is, was so important is the fact that unlike most of the accounts we have read so far, it tends to be fundamentally positive. China is good, great, special, wonderful, etc., etc. Good qualities. Negative points are much fewer and much more rare, much, much less common than in the other accounts we have read so far. Yet another reason why this text was so important and so popular is its pretense, supported by fact, to offer information on everything. And indeed, in relation to China, the book contains sections on geography, climate, peoples, products, history, kings, organization of the state and of the provinces, cities, roads, architecture, the dispositions, countenance and apparel of the people, religion, death, 
and uh, uh, marital rights, charity, all sorts of miscellaneous matters. You can get an idea about what it contains if you take a look at its table of contents, the first part, only the first part of the book here, and uh, uh, the way that the chapters can, uh, are descriptive. Notice, for instance, that you do have a chapter dedicated to uh, classical China or China from ancient times, about the 15th provinces, about the cities or towns in all of them, and so on and so forth. Now, this continues, and the first part of the text is divided into several books. But we won't be able to do more than simply scratch the surface here. There is, moreover, a second part in which Mendoza describes three different missionary voyages to China taking place in the 1570s and 1580s, but we are not going to discuss it here. Mendoza calls the country China. He does mention, just like Da Cruz, that the Chinese people at the time called themselves Tamijin, yeah, or Ming people, Taminran. Yeah. However, he does not build on what Martin de Rada, an important source for him, had said. The fact that China is the same as Marco Polo's Cathay, and the fact that the word, the, the formula uh, Dunghua, was used in the Philippines by Chinese merchants. Unlike Da Cruz, he relies, he does not rely on Herodotus at all. Do remember that Da Cruz took Herodotus into account uh, one way or another, dismissing classical information and also rationalizing it. His information about the population is not particularly correct, or is not particularly accurate, kind of vague and unexpected. He talks about color, um, noticing the differences between brown skinned, white skinned, and yellow skinned inhabitants of China. He does compare the Chinese people with the Germans. This is uh, a common comparison made by Spanish or Portuguese uh, uh, writers. No, not very common, but we can see it here and there. They didn't know much about Germany. And moreover, Germany, or at least Alemania or something, was sometimes imagined to be a neighbor of China's to be covering the territory of Russia today. So don't be shocked if you see this here and there. Um, he continues by giving a really, really, really uh, extended description of the Chinese government, insisting on how uh, enlightened this government is and how much the uh, people who function as officials of the state are uh, trained in moral and natural philosophy as well as astrology or philosophy at large. With Mendoza, something that we have seen kind of articulated but not fully as a um, uh, way of referring to China now is strongly repeated in various ways. The fact that China has an ideal government or an excellent government. Something that as next centuries Europeans will begin to emphasize the Europeans can learn from. Of course China is rich just like Cathay. We have take a look at the words in red over here marvelous rich gold, silver, great price, great curiosity, something like good skill, precious stones, great value, and so on and so forth. So a rich land, just like Cathay had been. The system, uh, the, the administration uh, uh, of China is further described in uh, uh, with more detail in the next chapters with Mendoza insisting on the or orderliness of government and 
of the morality of administration. This idea that China is a land where uh, justice reigns and where officials are moral people who understand uh, the world philosophically will be one of the things that Europeans would love to believe about China in the next centuries a great deal. And these ideas will become only stronger and stronger and stronger. And we can trace them back in their, one of their earliest forms, to Mendoza. We are, to put it otherwise, in the presence of what would be later called Sinophilia, an appreciation of China, a love of China. Later, the next century and mostly the early 18th century, China would become a model state to be emulated and copied by European states in many of its aspects. Such ideas appear already here. What else? Incorruptibility, well-developed bureaucracy, based on harsh punishments, that's true. Good organization of the justice system, and unlike what earlier observers noticed, an inclination to show mercy. No criminal is sentenced to death without give, being given one extra chance to save his life. So even this trope of the harshness of justice gets uh, watered down with Mendoza. All in all, as Donald Luck beautifully puts it, Mendoza's China is a wonderful construction of the mind. I quote from Luck. Mendoza's primary objective in his discussion of administration is to present a comprehensive and coherent account of its structure and functioning. His sources, limited and inadequate as they were, provided him with enough material to enable him to paint a plausible picture of the central administration, the provincial hierarchy, the system of justice and surveillance, the censorate and prison conditions. None of his sources singly gave him a total image comparable to what he was able to produce in Europe, once again he didn't go to China, by piecing together numerous odd bits and pieces of information. His achievement was something of a tour de force in deduction and rationality. A point, indeed, well worth remembering. But like many constructions of the mind, Mendoza's description of Chinese government is too neat to be a faithful reflection of reality. Nowhere, for example, does he affirm, as Cruz and Rada do, that corruption and bribery were widespread at all levels of government and justice. Nor does he mention the role played in government by the expanding eunuch core of the Ming dynasty. In practically all of his other discussions, he likewise avoids pointing directly to the ills or inconsistencies within the Chinese system of government. So obviously, Mendoza is a man with an agenda making China an interesting place where Christians should go because they would meet rational partners who will be easily converted to Christianity. Mind the fact that he wrote the book at uh, the request of the Pope. Now, he mentions many other things like the fertility of the Chinese lands, the tax system. He mentions the famous uh, sailing chariots. I told you about this a bit earlier. We have a representation of them over here. Um, so they have coaches and wagons that go with sails. And they, uh, they are made with such industrial policy that they um, uh, can be very easily used. Uh, this particular means of transportation will remain a matter of much interest and curiosity.
and we'll find it discussed or represented in quite a few later sources. Uh, he does mention foot binding. He's the first European uh, that does so extensively. He takes uh, or he begins, uh, he um, um, repeats the trope of China uh, as having no beggars and in the English translation the comparison to Europe is made quite directly a mirror for us to look upon yeah. in a marginal note and many many other wonderful things not least connected to writing notice the three characters as they appear in the English version over here he takes them from Escalante this is uh, fundamentally influenced by Escalante he talks about 6,000 characters he talks about one of the first Europeans to mention the difficulties of Chinese writing uh, well on in a widely circulated text because otherwise Europeans had mentioned this uh, privately already so with great difficulty and they are long in learning it um, their language. Uh, he continues the uh, chapter on uh, writing with a long and very exciting description of how the schools are organized in China. He mentions the fact that Chinese schools offer training in everything but they all specialize in writing and reading. They are sciences in and of themselves. He talks about um, uh, professors, he talks about students. All in all, he makes China into a empire of learning, into an empire of education. This idea that China is a land of perfect government where philosophy is studied and read and where people uh, are wise because they spend their life studying was amazingly uh, uh, appealing to later Europeans who would fall in love with the idea and would keep on uh, comparing things to the actual state of things in Europe at the time. It was becoming more and more developed but they thought not in a comparable manner to the way things were in China. Uh, he is one of the first uh, writers to focus extensively on Chinese history and he also brings into discussion uh, when reviewing information on Chinese history biblical references as well. Many travelers in later times and in the 17th century in particular would have difficulties in making the biblical story of the world match Chinese histories. The Bible doesn't talk about Huang Ti. So who is Huang Ti? Because according to Chinese histories he must have lived at the time of, I don't know, the flood. So how do we match the two things? This would become quite a significant intellectual problem mid 17th century. With Mendoza we have a, uh, a first uh, connection with the Bible uh, and the uh, idea that uh, the Chinese are descendants of one of the sons of Noah. Uh, this bringing together of European uh, uh, biblical history and Chinese history gets its first expression therefore here. So does the name of Vitei. Vitei would be Huang Ti. But uh, it would uh, become a common word uh, uh, for a while in various European texts including literary pieces. The Grand Vitae is the main character in an Italian romance published 
close to the end of the century. He also mentions actual historical characters from the Qin dynasty and then from Han times. So he has his information and it's not incorrect, on the contrary. He insists that China is eager to embrace Christianity. Notice that he does so in a manner that again anticipates a very important late 17th century development. Just like later writers would say, Mendoza insists that Christianity for China is less, it cannot be understood as a way of learning new things, but rather as a way of remembering. To put it otherwise, some time ago, somehow, the Chinese had an understanding of God as one unique uh, supreme deity and teaching the Chinese Christianity is basically a memory act making them remember their own religious history. This idea would be articulated in the next century significantly with Mendoza we have just a number of comments here and there in the sections dedicated to the religion of the Chinese announcing it and this is one of them. It appears to be a truth that the Apostle Saint Thomas preached in China. So an Apostle from the times of Jesus. And we may presume that all which we have seen uh, all sorts of religious aspects that somehow might seem Christian to an European observer remained printed in their hearts from his doctrine. To put it otherwise, Chinese morality, Chinese ethics are in fact due to Western knowledge brought to China from the times of Jesus. As I just told you, a similar version of the same argument would be much, much, much more developed later in the next century. This is very interesting because the Chinese are basically not required to us to, to learn anything new. What they are required from the missionaries' perspectives is to remember. Conversion is an act of memory. But this will become much more clear as we move on. I'm just anticipating it and this is, that's why I emphasized this, right? Christian faith is associated, so embracing the Christian faith is associated with the idea of, recup of, of uh, remembering, recuperating things, recuperating knowledge. We stop here uh, a bit earlier than I wished, than I wanted, and uh, we will continue next week.